Hi, everyone. I'm Doreen Redman from AARP North Dakota, and I'm so glad you've joined us for today's Passport to Healthy Living Historic Capital City Tour. Taking these events online is one way we can still connect and do it in a safe way and cover some healthy living topics. I think you're going to enjoy today's topic especially. For more than 60 years, AARP has been working to help promote the well-being and health of those older Americans 50 plus. And we're doing that now too with these Passport to Healthy Living programs online. Today, we're pleased to be joined by local history tour guide, Paulette Bullinger, and she is going to bring to life the history of Bismarck, our capital city that was once known as the wickedest city in the West. Paulette is also a photographer, so you're going to see lots of her great photos, along with some from the State Historical Society of North Dakota and the Bismarck Veterans Memorial Public Library. So we thank those two organizations also for sharing their photos with us and for Paulette's photos of current Bismarck. So you'll see past and you'll see present. And be sure to post any, que any questions you come up with on Facebook along the way. Paulette is going to be monitoring the Facebook site and answering any questions along the way uh, as those appear. Also, um, just wanted to let you know, we recorded this 24-minute program with Paulette yesterday, and she covers lots of ground in 24 minutes. So I encourage you to sit back and enjoy today's Passport to Healthy Living historic Capital City Tour. Well, I'd like to thank you um, for inviting me to do this tour of downtown Bismarck. I love the history of the downtown Bismarck area, and I love sharing it with all kinds of different visitors. So this is going to be really lots of fun to do this virtually. So my name is Paulette Bullinger, and I am your tour guide for this virtual tour of downtown Bismarck. And as we walk through this, the streets of Bismarck, I I hope that later on you'll have some questions. You can ask those as well. Uh, I'm going to make a disclaimer. First of all, I am not a professor type historian. I am um, just a very local person who's very interested in the, the history and um, have studied a lot of different things. So um, I, I enjoy sharing them and uh, so let's go. So first of all, my tour typically starts at the corner of, Peaco of the Peacock Alley on Fifth Street in Maine and Bismarck. At that time, we visit a little bit about why Bismarck is geographically located where it is and why it is named Bismarck. Uh, first of all, there were some early explorers who came through the area in 1738. Uh, Verendre came through the area. He was a fur trader and he was followed by Lewis and Clark. Um, the Lewis and Clark expedition who passed here to the west in 1804 and then came downstream in 1806. And that's why on either side of the Missouri, we have two highways named 1804 and 1806. We also had another uh, man named David Mitchell who um, started a fur trading business and another man named Joseph Dietrich who homesteaded along the Missouri in 1868. All these people would probably be very surprised at what Bismarck looks like today. In 1872, the Northern Pacific Railroad came to locate its terminal at a place known as the Crossing of the Missouri. A little town called Burley Town was located about two miles south of Bismarck now, and it was started by a man named Dr. Walter Burley. Not only was he a doctor, but he was also a railroad contractor and a speculator, and we'll talk a little bit more about him later on. They also established uh, Camp Greeley, which was named after a famous newspaper publisher, Horace Greeley. One day in 1872, the Ida Stockdale, the steamboat brought the first troops to the area um, to visit the, the sites. Here, first of all, to set up um, a camp for the soldiers, and the soldiers were here to protect the railroad workers. And uh, so that was their, their immediate job. The camp was, renamed um, Camp Hancock later on by uh, after General W. Hancock, who was here to protect the railroad crew. And as I say, that's when the trouble started. Between 1871 and 1872, a town similar to the Gold Rush days um, established itself about a mile east of Burleytown. The settlement was an eyesore to the higher military command, but was very popular with the common soldier. 
Carlton City sprouted across from Fort McKean at the popular river crossing and earned various names such as Point Pleasant, Whiskey Point, and others that are unrepeatable. It sported 15 saloons, two stores, two livery stables, and various houses of ill repute. The spring ice break of 1874 obliterated the Sin City. And what uh, I read in an interesting article about that, that the women of the fort who followed their, their soldiers here didn't know whether to um, applaud the breakup or to pray for the people that were swept away. At the time of its birth in 1872, Bismarck was the only town west of Fargo in the midst of Indian territory. On May 14, 1872, a town site was staked out and was christened the Edwinton in honor of Edwin Perry Johnson, a Vermont civil engineer for the Northern Pacific Railway. He was the first to urge the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. The town site was situated on the east bank of the Missouri River at a point reached in 1873 by the westward construction of the Northern Pacific Railroad. In 1873, the post office of Edwinton was established and also the Bismarck was named in honor of Germany's Iron Chancellor, Baron, the Prince Baron Otto Edward Leopold von Bismarck Schoenhausen. He was a famous German statesman uh, from Prussia and was cre uh, credited with the creation of the German Empire. The reason why they named Bismarck after him, they were hoping to get some investments. And, um, and they were hoping because they gave him the honor of naming Bismarck after him, um, he would dig, dig deep into his pockets and send some money over because the, the railroad was in a financial crisis at this time. It was called the Panic of 1873, which halted the building of the railroad uh, for six years. And so Bismarck literally became the end of the line. Well, Otto, the, the, the Mr. Bismarck from um, the Prussian Empire, he said that um, that was very nice. And he sent a thank you note and that was the end of that story. So the panic of 1873 caused the, the railroad to stop at that point and finally waiting for the building of the uh, bridge, which would complete the railroad. But that was basically the end of the line for a lot of people. A lot of interesting people basically got off the train at that point. We had speculators, we had um, ruling class, we had we had all kinds of different people who were interested in, in having a little bit of heaven here in Bismarck. Finally, a bridge crossing the Missouri was completed in 1882, almost 10 years after the railroad reached the Bismarck. This bridge completed the line. In July of 1873, that same month, Edwinton was named Bismarck. Burley County was organized and Bismarck had 147 buildings, primarily tents and log huts. The first church um, was built and used as a school on July 6th of 1873. The first issue of the Bismarck Tribune came out. And in June of 1874, the first law came to Bismarck. The first mayor of Bismarck was Edmund Hackett and um, he was appointed by the Act of Territorial Le Legislature, and then John McLean was elected in 1875. The city of Bismarck was incorporated on January 14th, 1875. Well, what put Bismarck on the map? In 1876, the Battle of the Little Bighorn put Bismarck on the world map. In 1877, the Sheridan House was built to house railroaders. Also in March of 1877, Bismarck was hit with the first major fire in the business district. Following the arrival of the railroad, Bismarck quickly became a center of trade and transportation. Steamboat business developed and flourished for a time on the Missouri, and Bismarck became a port as well as a railroad terminus until the railroad bridged the Missouri in 1883. Gold discoveries in the Black Hills made Bismarck a freight shipping center and long wagons pulled by oxen, uh, traversed the 300 mile uh, Custer route to the Black Hills. Well, um, we're gonna talk a little about, about Bismarck becoming the capital city. In 1883, Bismarck became the capital of Dakota Territory. Six years later, when the, the territory divided into two states, Bismarck became the capital of North Dakota. So at our first stop, there is a historical marker showing the spot where a telegraph was sent about the Little Bighorn. The marker stands to the south of the Peacock Alley on the east side of the former train station. It reads, 
On approximately this spot, on July 5th, 1876, Colonel Clement Lonsberry, the founder of the Bismarck Tribune, in a feat of newspaper enterprise that overcame many obstacles, flashed by telegraph to the New York Herald the first account of the General Custer's defeat and death at the Little Bighorn. Few stories so have electrified a nation. This spot was marked by the state Delta Chi and the North Dakota Press Association in April of 1953. This spot is considered by many as a place that put Bismarck on the map and everyone across the country would soon know, know about Bismarck. Some thought this was even fake news. To keep the telegraph line between Bismarck and St. Paul open, Lounsbury had the telegraph operator transmit Bible verses. The telegraph bill was more than $3,000 and more than $68,800 today. If we look to the east, um, over the railroad tracks, we see the Bismarck Tribune building. In that area previously, there was an establishment owned by Elizabeth McClellan, or better known in Bismarck as Little Casino. Yes, her business was of the service kind and quite successful as well. The Deuce of Spades became her brand for her business and she carried that card with her when she needed to advertise. When leaders of Bismarck came together working on a bid to make Bismarck the capital of Dakota Territory, she was said to have unofficially given, although her name does not appear on the list of donors, $1,200 to the cause. When asked if that wasn't a lot of money for her, she simply looked around the room and said she saw much more from where that came from. And she was also known to help the community community and willing to be help someone who is struggling. She is buried in the Wilton, North Dakota Cemetery and um, a group gave her a proper headstone. Now, as we go more to the West, this is a site where the, the train station now stands. This was first occupied by a hotel. The hotel was quite elaborate for its time. It was the Sheridan House. It served as, as a railroad passenger depot, and it was later split in half and moved across the street to the corner of Main and Fifth. On the east side, it named the Northwest Hotel. This was to make room for the railroad station. The depot was completed in December of 1901 at a cost of $33,600. The Northern Pacific Depot, noted for its Spanish mission style architecture, uncommon for the Northern Plains. By 1916, the Northern Pacific Depot was serving a 24 passenger trains daily. 1950s started the decline and it closed in 1975. The building later housed a brewery and a restaurant. And at this time, there are no current operating businesses on the, in the building. A couple of unique features on this building were the yin yang symbols and the Cupid dolls buried by workers inside the walls. Our third stop, as we head west on Main Street and we look towards the east, this photo shows the, the streets as it were before. And you can even imagine before the photo from the State Historical Society that the roads were basically mud. And um, it was uh, a lot of manure from the horses that would have been there before. So, um, and then the recent photo is one I took just recently. So um, a kind of a neat comparison. Um, so if, then there is a, a building that houses a uh, furniture store at this time. And this store at one time held a, a store that was called the Webb Brothers store. The Webb Brothers built this building for their department store in 1900. For a time, the rooms upstairs were used for the federal district as courtrooms until the federal building was constructed. I read that not only did they sell dry goods, they also offered embalming. Last year, I later years, I remember this building as the Sears building when I was growing up, but is now housed by the furniture store. Also, there, is a, there were other means of transportation around early Bismarck, not, even, not just the horse and buggy, but also of automobiles. And there was a trolley, a trolley that went up to the state capitol building uh, and around Main Street. Our fourth stop, as we continue west, will arrive at Camp Hancock. This site preserves part of a military installation that's uh, as Camp Greeley in 1872 that we talked about earlier to provide protection for work gangs 
then building the Northern Pacific Railroad. The camp's name was changed to Camp Hancock in 1873. A log headquarters building still stands on the site. It has been enlarged and remodeled several times and the logs have been concealed by a flatboard siding. The building serves as an interpretive museum with artifacts and information about local history. The site also has the Bread of Life Church. The Bread of Life Church was first located at Avenue A and Mandan Street and the church named St. George's Episcopal was moved to third and Rosser about 1900. There a small parish house was built and later joined to the rear of the church. When the new St. George's Episcopal Church at Avenue B and 4th Street was completed, the former property was sold and later acquired for a building in a site by the Presbyterian Church. The old structure was donated to the state and moved to Camp, Camp Hancock in 1965. It has been restored to its post-1885 appearance. Following the restoration, the congregation of St. George's donated a number of uh, original furnishings now in the building. Another interesting marker that we see on our screen now is um, on the grounds, it shows the place of the first non-Catholic baptism. Not sure why that was important, but apparently they thought it was enough to put a, a, little, a little sign there. There's also a neat steam engine on the grounds and the historical site is, has a great self-guided tour as well. Our fifth stop, as we head back across the street to the north side of Main Street, takes us towards downtown Bismarck on, on that side of the street. I'd like to point out some of the historic buildings and architecture as we walk. The Prince Hotel is interesting because um, it was built in 1916, 1916 it was named the, the Van Horn. And um, people who stay here were Shirley Temple, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. The building now houses, um, it's called Sunrise Apartments and it houses a 70, 74 unit apartments to low income residents and people with disabilities. When interesting architectural detail is the lions that are around the top of the building um, in located in different spots, basically almost all around the entire building. Then um, walking further as we look up 4th Street, we'll talk a little bit about the reputation this street had in the early years. One author I read said no proper woman would be caught dead on that street. Nicknamed Bloody Fourth or Murr's Gulch, it had quite a reputation. Local photographer Shane Balkowicz, a wet plate photographer, actually captured the, the way it may have looked very well. And, and you can see that photo downtown. I have a lady who was on one of my tours and uh, she was uh, in the wheelchair most of the time. But when she saw that photograph, she stood up and she, had, she said, I think that lady's me <laughs> in the photo. But um, it's, it's enjoyable to look at and to think of what might have looked like on Bloody Fourth. But then if we look up 4th Street now, we see a, a nice, peaceful looking street, uh, tree lined with, and it's hard to imagine that this was a place of saloon fights, gambling, prostitutes, crime of all kinds, seemingly on this, um, this quiet street. As we travel farther east on North Main Street, we see a lot of activity on some of the older buildings going on right now. They're bringing them back to their old historic look. Woolworths once stood on the corner of 4th and Main. The buildings housed the, that blow, housed the Barney Stone were built around 1906 and housed several businesses, including the Golden Dragon Restaurant, um, which opened sometime in the 1960s. The two buildings were originally constructed by, in 1905 by C.M. Dahl to house his men's clothing store and his tailor shop, which remained in that site for several decades. Next to the Blarney Stone is the Dakota Stage Playhouse. And that was built in 1905 by Edward Patterson. This building housed the Capitol Theater, later the Cinema Theater for several decades. It was one of the first movie theaters in Bismarck. In the 1970s, it showed adult films. Today, it is the home of the Dakota Stage Playhouse. It is next to the historic and famous Patterson Hotel built in 1910. And the original nameplate is visible at the top of the center of the building and it reads 1905 E.G. Patterson. Above the Dakota Stage Playhouse is the once beautiful silver ballroom of the Patterson. Now it is used as storage for, by the Playhouse for props, etc. 
It's hard to imagine this place was once so important to North Dakota uh, politicians for all kinds of things. I believe Mackenzie actually laid in state at this uh, particular spot after he passed away. Then our sixth stop is probably one of the most interesting buildings downtown Bismarck. The Patterson Hotel was originally named the Mackenzie. It was built in 1910 by E.G. Patterson. It was opened in Jan on January 1st, 1911, in time for the legislative sessions that year. It remained the Patterson Hotel in, um, and it, were, it remained the Patterson Hotel in 1928. Originally, uh, it was eight stories high and topped with a roof garden, but two completed and two partial floors were later added, bringing the total height to 12 stories. And the reason why the construction lasted about 20 years was to avoid property taxes. There was a code at the time that said property taxes could not be collected until a building was complete. So it was slowly built on over the years. The rooftop garden was added in 1920. Following the fire that destroyed the first capital, the state government moved to the hotel until the new capital building was built. Famous visitors were Theodore Roosevelt, Calvin Coolidge, John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. Also Patterson was a boxer, so he also had boxing friends um, who stayed there. The Patterson was also known for secretly serving alcohol during prohibition and even installed an elaborate electronic alarm system to keep out unwanted guests. It was also rumored to hold illegal gambling and rumored um, to house prostitutes. Rumors of underground tunnels beneath the streets of Bismarck also abound. It, it is cur currently also being renovated back to an earlier look with a sign that will say Patterson Place at the top. The building currently houses a Peacock Alley Barn restaurant, as well as a, a HUD Section 8 low-income housing for elderly and disabled residents. As we travel up Fifth Street, on the west side of the street is the Sioux Hotel. It once was named the Prince's Hotel as a spoof on the Prince Hotel we saw earlier. It was built in 1906 by Patterson, and for a short time, this was the tallest building, building in Bismarck. It was annexed into the Patterson Hotel. Now, um, our seventh stop, we turn to an alley on the east side of Fifth Street, also called Alley 5.5, which contains great wall art by various artists in the area. There's a lot of detail in the art, and it's, it's very fun. A lot of people like to have their photographs taken here, um, senior photographs, uh, visiting photographs. There's all kinds of beautiful artwork on display in this alley. And then our eighth stop, we will look at other historic buildings in this area. One is the St. Mary's Catholic Church. It was built in 1898. And if you will see the front um, window that has the Madonna in it, that was donated by the Medora von Hoffman. And the church was built at a cost of $12,000 originally. Finally, as we go down on the street, we'll see the Bell May House um, Auditorium. The Bell May House City Auditorium greeted its first crowd in January of 1914 and has been um, an important part of the community ever since. Uh, the building, which is listed on the National Register of Historic Places, was painstakingly renovated in the mid-1990s uh, thanks to combined efforts of city leaders, art, organiza art organizations, citizens, and private sector people. The bell was named after Bell Mayhus, who was a piano teacher from Bismarck. And finally, the World War Memorial Building was built in 1930 to provide space for community functions, a National Guard Armory, gymnasium, and convention hall. It was also used by the North Dakota State Legislature in 1931 after the original Capitol building, burned and, and hosted numerous inaugural balls for North Dakota governors. Then our last building will be the Burley County Courthouse. In, and it was designed in Art Deco, Art Deco style by architect Ira Rush. It was built in 1931 and was listed on the U.S. National Register of Historic Places in 1985. And if you can visit, one of the highlights of the courthouse is the art mural showing the state and local history by a local artist, 
Bill Gannon, and Minneapolis artist painted other artwork depicting the history and wildlife of the area. The entrance mural show the history of Burley County from Primaryville Prairie through the pioneer period. Above the wainscoting is a first two floor, in the first two floors are the walls are covered with canvas, which have paintings of birds and animals native to Burley County. Once again, Burley County was named after Dr. Walter Burley. He was a doctor, Indian agent, trader, and delegate to the 39th and 40th Congress. Unfortunately, his time as an Indian agent was noted for corruption. He was awarded the contract to grade the NP Railroad from 50 miles east of Bismarck to the river. He used his personal knowledge to establish a town called Burley Town. The railroad did not approve of his insider knowledge. And because of flooding two miles south of Bismarck, he, um, it was ordered that the rails be moved up to the current site. There is so much more to learn about Bismarck. Um, there are so many more places I could show you. Um, but this is basically the history of downtown Bismarck. So I thank you for um, following along today. And um, I, I encourage you when you when everything is back to normal, go downtown and do a walk and and ask me and I'll and I'll come along with you. Thank you. Great. Wasn't that an interesting look at our historic capital city uh that was that was just so awesome I, I learned a lot i've lived in bismarck about 40 years and i know i picked up a lot of uh great knowledge that i didn't know before so thanks paulette and remember be sure to put your questions in facebook uh we'll be happy to make sure that um, we get back to you and answer those and paulette's going to be monitoring it and we'll answer those questions herself so um gosh that was awesome but I also want to remind you too, next month we're going to get together and we're going to be talking about cooking. We're going to have some healthy harvest cooking demonstrations from the folks at Family Wellness in Fargo. So I'm really looking forward to that. They're going to demonstrate a few different recipes and talk about how we can use all these wonderful healthy harvest uh, foods that we have uh, a plenty right now. So we'll be doing that on the third Wednesday at three o'clock. Uh, so look forward to that. And keep in mind, all these programs are being recorded so that they can be viewed later. You can find them on our YouTube channel at AARPND. So they will be uh, living there and you can always go back and take a look at them. So thank you again for joining us today for this Passport to Healthy Living Historic Capital City Tour. And we look forward to having you join us next month. Thanks. <music>